Perhaps you've uh, come this morning and perhaps like me, you feel like you've had all those weeks where you're pulled in a lot of different directions and you're just wary and you're anticipating the next week to be the same. <laughs> We're very similar, uh, pulled in a lot of different directions. And I just recognize in, in that, I recognize again my weakness and uh, inability to do what needs to be done uh, here this morning is for Christ to be proclaimed and glorified. And you see, it's what, it's what I need. And uh, uh, it's, I know what you need. We need to see the Lord Jesus. And I know I can't do that. He has to do that uh, by his spirit through his word. And keep me out of the way and uh, to speak. And so would you uh, look to him in dependence as I do here as well, just uh, praying that the Lord Jesus will be seen this morning. We respond to him for who he is and what he's done for us and we'll see again in this passage so let's look to the Lord in prayer Heavenly Father we, we come before you and Father this is not a road act of uh, going through the motions and saying some words but uh, Father in recognition that we truly need you we are in total utter dependence uh, this uh, can't be done uh, in our, our weakness and in our strength and our uh, ability we're unable and so, Father, we look to you for what only you can do. We want you to be glorified, the Lord Jesus to be glorified and seen. We know that's our, our greatest need and our, and our heart's desire. And we know this is done uh, not by might, not by power, but by your spirit, by your spirit, Father, and through your word. And so, Father, that's what we're riveted to. We want to be riveted to the Lord Jesus Christ because he is everything. He is the treasure of all treasures, the King of kings, and and Lord of lords, and he is our Savior, our Redeemer. And so, Father, would you just take uh, your word and open our eyes to it uh, today, open our eyes to your Son, and may we respond to him. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, today, as uh, 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 Pastor John read, we're in Mark 15, 1 to 20, as we take another uh, step uh, closer to the cross. And, we have walked with Jesus, haven't we, into the garden called Gethsemane, where we heard the loud cries, and we, we saw the tears as Jesus agonized over the anticipation of drinking the cup, the cup of God's wrath for uh, sin, for our sin, for, for, for my sin, the cup that was ours to drink, that he took, as Spurgeon said, in both hands, and drank it dry, drank damnation dry. We have watched Jesus betrayed by a kiss, an act of friendship. We watched him taken by a mob to the house of Caiaphas, the high priest, for a completely unjust trial at night. We saw him condemned, sentenced to death for blasphemy, proclaimed to be God, though he is God. He is the Messiah. And we recognize, in my place, condemned he stood. We heard Peter, uh, didn't we? Uh, in the courtyard of Caiaphas, denied that he even knew Jesus three times, cursing as he denied that he knew Jesus. And we heard the cock crow the second time. We watched Jesus look at Peter, knowing Peter had denied him. We walked with Christ toward a hill called Calvary, as though we were standing right there in the scene, because as we repeatedly said, in a real sense, we were. It was our sin that put Jesus there. What we see today, what we'll read today in Mark 15, it's our, our sin that, that put him through this trial. Jesus moving toward a hill called Calvary because of our, our sin. We'll now stand by Jesus today, and what we will see is the second part of his trial where he stands before Pilate, the Roman governor. The passage before us gives us what will be the response of the world what well, the response of the world would be today if the King of Kings and Lord of Lords would stand before them. But it would be the same response. It wouldn't be different today. If there was a worldwide election uh, for King this past Tuesday, our world would not vote for, would not have elected the true King, Jesus Christ. They would not choose him. That nobody would us. He chooses us. In our passage today, as the long-awaited king, the Messiah, the Redeemer, stands before them, we'll hear the Hosannas as we stand there, turn to crucify him, crucify him. So you see uh, four points in your study sheet. The first is this, Jesus the king, in the hands of the religious leaders, falsely 
accused. And look, they're beginning in verse 1 of Mark 15. It says, as soon as it was morning, they had conducted again an illegal trial <clears throat> overnight. And so as soon as morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council, this whole Sanhedrin. And, and note that word consultation. What, what they're doing is they're scheming. <laughs> They're, they're, they're conniving, they're calculating what charge to come up with against Jesus to give to Pilate, the religious leaders, the Sanhedrin. They, they don't have the authority to execute criminals under Roman rule. They, they don't have the power, the Jews didn't have the power of capital punishment. That authority belonged to the Roman governor. So in order to secure Jesus' crucifixion, they had to come up with a different charge than blasphemy. The charge of Jesus claiming to be Messiah would have been a little concern to Pilate. And so in their scheming, conniving, cunning, consultation, they modified the charge to bring Jesus to Pilate, claiming that Jesus was guilty of sedition, guilty of treason. That is, Jesus claimed to be king, a, a rival to Caesar. And so the end of verse 1 says they bound Jesus and led him away and delivered him over to Pilate. In verse 2, Pilate asked him, because this was the charge that was brought to him about Jesus, Pilate asked him, are you the king of the Jews? Literally, uh, Pilate says, you are the king of the Jews. By the time Pilate sees Jesus, by the time Jesus is brought before Pilate, He's probably a bloody mess, if you remember. At the end of the first part of the trial, uh, they slapped him. They punched him in the face repeatedly. His probably eyes swollen together, nose bleeding, lips, lips puffed. This is not the kind of king or rival to Caesar that Pilate would envision or would have been concerned about. So Pilate asks, are you? You are the king of the Jews? And Jesus' answer is a positive one. You have said so. He affirms the truth that he is the Messiah. He's Israel's long-awaited king. He tells the truth. John, in his gospel, informs us that Jesus followed his response with these words. My kingdom is not of this world. <clears throat> and Pilate seems to have perceived this. He, he does not perceive very clearly as we go through the passages as a political threat to Caesar. Uh, he doesn't. He doesn't see it that way. And the chief priest perhaps sensing that Pilate is not convinced. Verse 3 says the chief priest accused him of many things. In response to all of these accusations, Jesus remains silent. And in verse 4, Pilate asks him again, have you no answer to make? See how many charges they, they bring against you. But Jesus made no further answer. So Pilate was amazed. Pilate is actually shocked that Jesus is not giving a defense. Now Jesus refuses to defend himself despite his innocence and amazes, it perplexes Pilate. Pilate doesn't realize that Jesus silences intentionally. That though falsely accused, he's silent for he has come to give his life a ransom for men. He has come to drink the cup. So first, we see Jesus the King in the hands of the religious leaders falsely accused. Second, Jesus the king in the hands of the crowd rejected. Um, Pilate does not perceive again Jesus' guilt. He does not see him as a threat to himself or to the emperor of Rome. He sees through the accusations of the chief priest being a savvy politician that he, that he is. He perceives the evil motive of the chief priest. Because verse 10, if you look at it, it tells us for it perceived that was out of envy that the chief priests had delivered him up. The religious leaders envied Jesus very clearly, and Pilate had picked right up on that. But Pilate has a problem. A crowd has begun to assemble, to, to form a, a crowd that Pilate must take into consideration. So Pilate, the, the pragmatist, he attempts to take advantage of a custom described for us there in verse 6, where it says, Now at the feast he used to release for them one prisoner for whom they asked. And among the rebels in prison who had committed murder in the insurrection, was a, there was a man named Barabbas. Verse 8, the crowd came up and began to ask Pilate to do as he usually did for them. So 
Pilate was going to give the crowd two options for this custom of releasing a prisoner at the feast. And option number one, Pilate said, here's a prisoner named Barabbas, a man guilty of sedition, guilty of murder. And the other option is Jesus, the, the miracle worker. Uh, an insurrectionist, terrorist, or Jesus. And Pilate assumes a crowd will reject, request the release of Jesus. And so Pilate asked the crowd a series of three questions, beginning with our verse 9, where it says he answered them. He answered the crowd, saying, Do you want me to release for you, release for you the king of the Jews? Pilate again is savvy. He's seeking to use this custom as an opportunity to release Jesus because he knows. He believes that Jesus is completely innocent. He knows, again, verse 10, the chief priests are acting out of envy. He assumes the crowd will want Jesus then to be released. Pilate would be there standing at the top of the steps of the Antonio, uh, Antonio Fortress. Steps that many years later, Constantine's mother moved to Rome as a birthday gift for Constantine. Steps that Catholics climb up on their knees, hoping for a blessing today. Pilate stands there assuming the crowd is going to clearly choose Jesus. But verse 11 tells us the chief priest stirred up the crowd and had them released for them Barabbas instead. The chief priests are working the crowd. The crowd gets work today as well, doesn't it? They're transferring their disdain and hatred for Jesus to the crowd, effectively stirring up the crowd here. And so the crowd calls for the release, not of Jesus, the crowd calls for the release of Barabbas. The crowd votes Barabbas. Pilate is perplexed by the cries of the crowd for the release of Barabbas. And so he asks them in verse 12, Pilate, uh, next question that he asks, he again said to them to the crowd, then what shall I do with this man that you call king of the Jews? Uh, Pilate is perplexed as the crowd is calling for the release of Barabbas, who is clearly guilty. And he asks the crowd, what do I do with Jesus, who is clearly innocent? And the crowd responds with these chilling words. In verse 13, hard to hear these words, isn't it? Crucify him. Crucify him. Remember, we're standing there in the scene. <laughs> you envision that. What is it that we, too, are crying out as we stand there uh, in the crowd? Pilate's third question expresses the struggle with the injustice of crucifying an innocent man. Look with me there, verse 14. Pilate said to him, why? What, what evil has he done? He, he knows Jesus is innocent, but they shouted all the more, crucify him. Crucify him. So Jesus, the king, in the hands of the crowd, is rejected. So third, Jesus, the king, in the hands of Pilate, uh, delivered up. In verse 14, Pilate just declared Jesus' innocence very clearly. Mark's making that uh, very, very clear to him. In John 19, 4, Pilate cries out, I find no guilt in him. This is an innocent man. And how does the crowd respond? They just turn up the volume. They repeat their cry louder and louder and louder. Crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. Pilate is convinced that Jesus is innocent. However, Mark informs us that Pilate's goal is not justice. But instead, his greatest concern is, is, is himself, his own political future. So then in verse 15, we read, So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, think of those words. There's Pilate's motive, what is most important to him. So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released for them Barabbas, and having scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. Pilate, motivated here by self-interest, what's in it for him, so he thinks he's wrong. <laughs> he's wrong. This would be the worst thing for his self-interest, but he thinks as a pragmatist about his own personal political aspirations. He doesn't want there to be a riot. It would not serve his interest that these Jewish subjects complain to the emperor about him. He's He's trying to satisfy the crowd. Pilate wishing to satisfy the crowd. And oh, how he wishes today, <laughs> how he wishes today, his wishes today, that he did not satisfy the crowd. Pilate wishing to satisfy the crowd. He's had so much time to think about this. 
And think of how many through the ages have given up Jesus, wishing to satisfy the crowd. So Matthew 27, 24 tells us, Pilate washes his hands of Jesus and says to the crowd, I'm innocent of this man's blood as if it were that easy. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Pilate's not washing away any guilt at all here. When he turns Jesus over, end of verse 15, he delivered him to be crucified. James Edwards in his commentary describes the scourging that Jesus received here. He said this, I quote, flogging was a cruel and merciless preparation for crucifixion. As a prelude to crucifixion, the prisoner was stripped and bound to a post and beaten with a weather, uh, leather whip woven with bits of bone and, and metal which acted like giant fish hooks, if you can imagine. And, uh, and would many times grip the chest and just pull uh, pieces of, uh, of flesh out all the way uh, around the back. No maximum number of strokes were prescribed. Uh, the scourging lacerated, stripped the flesh, often exposing bones, internal organs. One of the purposes was to shorten the duration of the crucifixion, but scourging was so brutal that some prisoners died before they ever reached the cross. Women were not allowed to witness the flogging. It was just too horrifying. Pilate knows that Jesus is innocent very, very clearly as we read this text in the other gospel accounts, but he still turns him over, wishing to satisfy the crowd. For Jesus the king in the hands of the Roman soldiers, mocked and ridiculed and abused. Look at verse 16. The soldiers led him away inside the palace, that is the governor's Headquarters. They uh, bring him back into the palace. There's a large opening in the praetorium, and they call together the whole battalion. Probably uh, could be as many as 600 men here. And they clothe him in a purple cloak and twist him together a crown of thorns. They put it on him and they began to salute him, "Hail, King of the Jews!" And they're striking his head with a reed and spitting on him and kneeling down in homage to him. They create a play here, if you will, to mock him. They dress up Jesus as a king. Though he is the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. They twist a crown of foreign storms and thrust it onto his head. They mock him, hail, King of the Jews. They repeatedly beat his head with a reed. Blood is probably everywhere. They spit on him. They shame him. Mockingly, they kneel down before him. There's no restraint in their cruelty. It's human depravity once again on full display. All this inflicted on the only one in this chapter who is truly innocent. Over and over, Mark makes clear to us the innocence of the Lord Jesus, the innocence of the king here, the innocence of the king of kings, and he draws our attention deliberately and intentionally to his innocence. Finally, verse 20, and when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the purple cloak and put his own clothes on him, and they led him out to crucify him. Luke tells us they ripped that coat off, that coat that was probably glued to the dry blood on his back. He suffers an indignity of nakedness, and then they put his own clothes back on him, and they let him out to crucify him. It will be next week. So Jesus, the king, in the hands of the Roman soldiers, mocked and ridiculed and abused. Now how do we respond this morning? How do we respond? First, when you suffer, follow Christ through your season of suffering. Hebrews 4, 15, and this is so uh, meaningful for us when we walk through the seasons of suffering. Hebrews 4, 15, and of course following 16, tells us that uh, we have a high priest, the Lord Jesus, who is not removed or, or distant from us in our suffering. He experienced it. He was tempted in every way as we are yet without sin. Listen to this. Catch this. Because this is unlike all the other false religions out there. Uh, this is not a made up God Allah who is distant and, and removed. <laughs> who, who, who will never 
stoop to suffering. Isn't that how it was made up God? Now this is King Jesus. This is your Savior who knows and understands, who knows what it is to be falsely accused. Now if you've ever been falsely accused, who knows what it is to be abandoned, who knows what it is to be betrayed, who knows what it is to be rejected, who knows what it is to be ridiculed or, or mocked or, 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 or abused, who knows what it is to be a, a, alone. Now, this is the King Jesus who knows and understands. You can come to him and know that he knows and know that he cares. You can draw near to the Savior for comfort. He knows. I know what you're going through, what's on your plate, and what's on your plate this coming week. This is a Savior you can draw near to. This Savior you can come to. What a Savior, right? Hallelujah, what a Savior. Peter will say in 1 Peter 2, beginning in verse 21, For this you've been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example, so you might follow. Follow him. Follow him in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. This is what we saw today in our, in our passage here in Mark. When he was reviled, he did not revile and return. When he suffered, he did not threaten. How did he do that? By continuing to entrusting himself to him who judges justly. That's so insightful, so good. In this world, you will suffer false accusation, rejection, neglect, pain, mocking, ridicule, abuse, even all the wars. We see this culture shifting away from God. We live in a world where we're often will be no way of getting justice in this world. But put your hope in the justice of God. <laughs> Jesus shows us how. There is a judge who judges justly. We can know that. In your season of suffering, when you're in that season, if you follow Christ through it, it may be the single most important season of your life. Follow Christ. He's worth following, isn't he? He knows. He knows exactly what you're going through. And you can follow him through your season of suffering. Secondly, lastly, be amazed. Oh, be amazed this morning. I mentioned Mark deliberately and intentionally highlights and, he, and he's underlining the innocence of the king, Lord Jesus, in this passage. Donald McLeod writes here uh, of this passage, these trials are an indispensable part of certifying for us, the lamb was without blemish or defect, completely innocent. It, it culminated in Pilate's unambiguous verdict. I find no basis for the charge against this man. It's an innocent man. Innocent. The question that should be on our minds is why? Why? If he's completely innocent, why is all this happening? He is condemned for a crime he did not commit. He's charged with blasphemy. He's completely innocent of blasphemy. He is God. He is charged with sedition. He's completely innocent of sedition. If he's innocent and he's sinless, why is he being crucified? And the answer, of course, is that he's being crucified for my sin, for your sin, that we might be forgiven of all of our sin. Be amazed here. Be amazed. He is taking my place. He's taking your place. He'll take the place of Barabbas on the cross, won't he? A cross very likely intended for Barabbas. And the two men crucified on either side of Jesus were most likely part of the insurrection and murder with Barabbas. And there is the story of our salvation. And the storyline of the Bible, the innocent one takes the place of the guilty. The innocent one substituted for the guilty us. Jesus punished in our place for our sins. We, like Barabbas, go free, forgiven. It's amazing grace. Amazing grace. It's the gospel. Pilate was amazed, as the text tells us, that he was silent when falsely accused. Amazed that Jesus didn't defend himself, knowing the seriousness of these charges. Pilate was amazed, asking, why does this man not defend himself? Pilate is amazed, but it isn't just Pilate who should be amazed this morning. We who have Jesus as our Savior, our amazement should greatly exceed Pilate's. It should stun us what Jesus does for us here. But we know he remains silent in order to die for our sins. The Redeemer remains silent to redeem us. He does not defend himself, though falsely charged and sentenced 
to this horrific punishment. Why? Because it's God's gracious purpose, his sovereign plan for his son to be delivered up for our sins and to remain silent in order to take the place of sinners like you and me. And if we're perceptive here, if we're perceptive, your hands, your voice is present in all of this. We bear responsibility here. It was our sins. It was our sins that made all this necessary. Our sins have made us deathless. James Boyce, and I'm going to close with uh, this uh, quote here from him. Uh, he's home with the Lord now. He's a, uh, a pastor of 10th Presbyterian in Philadelphia, a uh, wonderful, godly man. He says this. He says, some years ago I attended a play based on the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. One of the most dramatic scenes came at the end of Jesus' trial before Pilate when the religious leaders began to call for Jesus to be crucified. Suddenly, some people sitting in the audience around us joined the, 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 the mob up front shouting, crucify him, crucify him. It was going on all around us. While our attention had been drawn to the action up on stage, some of the actors had slipped in from the back of the auditorium and had taken their seats among us. And the effect of their shouting was to implicate the audience in the death of Christ, as if we ourselves were calling out for his crucifixion. And my first impulse was to quiet them down. No, I wanted to shout, stop, you can't kill him, he's, he's innocent. But then I remembered that I was a guilty sinner. And Jesus came to die for my sins too. In that moment, I realized that even if I did want Jesus to be crucified, I needed him to be crucified. Because my salvation depends upon his cross. So I laid down my resistance. I took my place in the guilty mind. I said in my heart, crucify him. Yes, crucify him, if he will be crucified. For I am a sinner who needs a sin. That's us in this city. We're the guilty ones. The guilty ones who needed Jesus to be crucified for us, to bear the punishment for our sin. No other way for us to be forgiven of our sin. And God, in his great love for us, if you ever doubt his love, if God demonstrates, he shows his love for us, that while we we're still sinners, Christ died for us. That, that's what we see here. Jesus so loved sinners like you and me that he was silent when falsely accused before mortal men and went to the cross that we might stand without fear forgiven in the presence of a holy God one day. And we cry out, don't we, hallelujah, what a Savior. Be amazed this morning. Be amazed. Would you join me in a word of prayer? Please join me. Heavenly Father, Father, we come before you, and uh, Father, uh, my heart's are just overwhelmed. My heart is overwhelmed. Because we see Jesus standing here. Silent, not defending himself, though these charges are, are ludicrous. They're, they're, they're absolutely horrendous. He's King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and nothing can bound him. He allows himself to be bound and beaten and abused. And You'll see next week on the cross. But Father, for us, there's no other way for sinners like us to be saved except through the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. And turning from our sin to trust Jesus Christ alone as our Savior, knowing none of our good works make a difference at all. It's His work, His work that we're watching and seeing and experiencing here as we walk through your word, His work at the cross. His shed blood. What can take away my sin? Nothing, nothing but the blood of Jesus Christ. We needed him to be crucified. He was a willing Savior, uh, fully God, fully man, who was crucified for us and risen, as we'll see at the end of Mark's gospel, risen and living and offering salvation freely through his work on the cross. We praise you, Father. We praise you. We praise the Lord Jesus. We're so thankful. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.